Hi, this is Gloria, your life coach. Welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Hi, this is Ron Johnson, your life coach and mentor coach, and welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Today, we have a special guest, and this is take two. That's no hint intended, no pun intended, Mm -hmm. but he's back again, James Lampkin. Welcome to Life's a Shuffle podcast. So before we get started, I want us to kind of introduce yourself. Tell me who you are and where you're from. Uh, First of all, thank you for the invite. I really appreciate it. Um, My name is James Lampkin. I'm from uh, Capitol Heights, Maryland. That's like literally right on the line of Washington, D.C. I'm a former government, federal government employee. I moved to San Jose, California in December 2019. And I have my own podcast called Conversations with Lamp. Awesome, buddy. Look at that. So you moved to California and you're out here. What do you think about Cali so far? Ah, it's it's different. Uh, coming from the East Coast, California is very different. Um, when I first, we get we arrived, we, we did a first tour in November. Um, the weather was... The weather was actually pretty warm. It wasn't like really hot, but it was nice. You could you could get the you could tell the difference in the weather. Um, you know, back in the DC area, it's cold in November. Like, cause when I first got here, when we did our first tour, that was like uh, November fifteenth, something like that, and it was about sixty degrees. Um, you could walk around with with a short sleeve shirt. The, the mornings were cold, which which was still the same, but just as the day went longer, it got warmer. So that was different. And it's just the scenery, the mountains, because we don't have that in the, um, we didn't have that in DC. Um, like I said, I'm from Capitol Heights and we didn't have like mountains and trees and all that stuff. I mean, you got trees, but it's just different. It's, it's California is a different animal. That's the, <laughs> it's the best <laughs> <laughs> well, the, yeah, the weather in California is unpredictable. That's for sure. Well, we know it's not going to rain certain months, so <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing, that's right? True. Yeah, that's true. You know, so I never been. To, you're from Virginia, right? Well, I lived in Virginia before we got here, but but because I grew, because most of my life was spent at Capitol Heights, Maryland. That's why I say that's where I'm from. But oh, the last okay. place I lived was Virginia. Virginia, okay, that's where I got that from. Yeah. So how how is it like in Maryland? It's, it's flat. There's no hills. Just oh, no, no, no. There's day. hills. There's oh god, there's hills. Yeah, there's hills. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's not like it's not like here. Um, but there's hills. It's man, I, I, California is just wow. I, I can't even. <laughs> It was just like a, a whole different world when I got here. Just the the atmosphere, the people that laid back, the scene again, the scenery, just like the mountains and um one <laughs> I, I I hate to say this, but one thing that did catch my eye, oh man, the roads here are filthy. Oh my god. I <laughs> I I couldn't believe how like how much trash and junk was on the side of the roads. Like that was new to me because where we're from, the roads are clean. Like there's no, like there may be like a sprinkling of a, a wrapper or something like that. Something somebody just randomly threw out their car where it's here. Man, it's like highway patrol don't even clean up the roads. I was like, good grief. It's mm-hmm. crazy. I think you know that, what? um, oh, go ahead. Uh, do you want to go first? <laughs> You go first. Go ahead. Okay. No, I was just going to say, I think um, I've noticed a lot more of that. And I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, Ron, when you were here, is when we had a lot of um, homeless because the, the, um, I, I can't, I think that's within the last few years. Um, I, I've been living in the Bay Area. Of, I've been living in San Jose almost my whole entire life. And, it wasn't like that before. Um, I did notice a lot more of it in the last few years, as far as I can remember. And I think it's, it has something to do with, you know, I, um, I don't want to be like the bad person here too, but you know, with the rise of the homeless that we had here in the last uh, few years was 
it was really bad. I mean, you, there was a lot of them. There's tents everywhere on the side street, you know, out, outside um, by the freeway. Uh, they were just everywhere. So they did a city cleanup, I think. So you moved here last year, last November? Yeah, yeah, November, November December, yeah. Right. So that happened um, early last year. Okay. So this is actually better than the, what you see is actually better than how it was before. It was it was so bad. Um, but Damn. yeah, it was bad. You know, I lived in California all my life, which is in San Diego first, where I was born and raised in the Bay Area. And um, what I've seen is probably a lot of political gibberish. You know, the, the story is that people, people from other states drop people off at homeless in California and you know that's why homeless populations overrun. What, I, what I'm really seeing here is in California, it seems a lot of money is being spent on God knows what. Okay, I'll tell you example of something. So every time you buy a phone in California or uh, a TV or anything with a screen, you get charged a recycling fee, right? And the whole purpose of the recycling fee is really to help dispose of items, okay? So that we not throw them in the trash. Uh, when's the last time you've seen a recycling facility for TVs or cell phones? I haven't seen one since they started this back in the early 2000s. Uh, our, there's no way to me, I'm really appalled at our politicians and our government and just these wealthy companies in California that, to me, maybe I don't see because I haven't done my research, so I, my facts may be incorrect, so forgive me if my facts are incorrect, but... So Northern California has Facebook, has Google, has all these companies that are there. And why are we not cleaning our streets? We have a lot of money. Rent is very expensive. Taxes are the highest. Why are streets not clean? Why are not people that literally need medical attention can't get medical help? You know, where they turn to? Um, and it was really also crushing a lot of people is you have working homeless. And what that really entails is that people that cannot afford the rent or afford a room to rent, they're now living on the streets or living on someone's couch or have a motor home to afford to live. Or some people say, just screw it. I, I, I can't afford it. I don't care anymore. I'll be on the streets. And that's just really happening. We're not helping people out and take care of this garbage, maintaining the roads, maintaining the freeways. And it, it, it's just really, really bad upon our government, really just not spending the money correctly. I mean, I'm in Washington and uh, Bellingham, Washington, and streets are pretty clean. Mm -hmm. You know, there's trash cans to throw stuff away. So all that is there. Why can't we have that in California? Why can't we have this? But it's just overpopulated. So you know what? You're, you're James is as baffled as I am. Why homeless is out of control? Why people that really need some help are, are not getting help? Why cost of living is out of control? Medical expenses out of control? Let me tell you this. Medical expenses per month, I would be saving up to $150 per month by living in Washington versus living in California. Wow, that because because when you're an entrepreneur, you pay medical insurance out your pocket, right? So the monthly rate be high. So pretty much, to give you an example, Kaiser for me is four hundred thirty nine dollars per month in California. Uh, starting starting in Washington, it would be about three hundred twenty five dollars a month. Wow, that's a big difference. That's a humongous difference. And just think about that: people that cannot afford to walk around with no medical insurance. Because the cost of living is just economically high. I mean, people. Are, how many car people do you know that are riding around in their car with no, with the car not being registered or no insurance because they just can't afford it? Man, I'm, I'm gonna interrupt you on that one because we just did the car thing, and <laughs> so I went to register my car. Um, my car was two hundred eighty five dollars, and I'm like, uh, hold on, what? You, it got to be a mistake. Like, why? Because where I'm coming from, like I said, I lived in Virginia. Virginia, it costed me like $110 to register my car for two years. Mm -hmm. I, paid, wow. I paid more than double for one year. And then when we went to register my wife's car, that one was $500 and 
like 586, something crazy. Like, I was like, where, where y'all getting these numbers from? Like, what is going on? Like, in yeah, California, this the, the the cost of living here is unbelievable. Like, and, and, the, and the thing is, it wasn't cheap <laughs> where I was at. Like, if you look up cost of living in um, Northern Virginia, it's it's in the top five. But coming here is just like wow. It, it was a, it was a just you you pay so many. That I think the sales tax like nine point two five, and then when I bought a soda one time, I'm like, what the hell is this bottle charge? Like California just make up things to charge you for. Same like. <laughs> What I did is we're going to charge you a CVS tax to have facilities to recycle bottles, but how many facilities do you see around recycling cans and bottles? Man. <laughs> That's the whole purpose behind that. So welcome to California, man. So you got to start making double your money every year just to maintain the small stuff. If you really look at your registration, car insurance, and gas, the reason why it's so expensive out here is all those small $0.05, cent, $0.10, cent, $0.20 cent taxes that are inside there. Because gas out here in Bellingham is two fifty nine a gallon, mm. two twenty five in some places, right? Depending on where you go, and it's like, okay, why it's so expensive? Like, how, it's, it's not the term should be not too expensive, but the term should be with the acceleration of cost, gas registration, car insurance, cost of living. Your paychecks don't accelerate at that rate, so yes, things become expensive because acceleration is too fast. Yeah. I remember I was at Fry's. I worked there. So Fry's, yeah, I'll be honest with you. I never, I probably said this on the podcast before. So, you know, the racial slur, the N word, that's like asking for a raise at Fry's. That's how bad it is. So it's like saying the N word. That, that's really how bad it is. Damn. And I had to use that kind of description only because it hits a home run to the fact that asking for a raise is okay. Well, if you want to ask for a raise, why don't you just quit for more money? That, that was a mentality. <laughs> so I remember uh, every year, you know, rent goes up about, I think, 0.935 every year, at least when I rented an apartment at the time. So I, I walked around with my rent increase in the back of my rent, my notice, sorry, my notice for rent, rent increase in my back pocket to get to my manager and I need to raise because the idea is there is no raises. That's that's the idea behind that. So mean, meaning that no 2% cost of an increase annually. It doesn't it doesn't exist. And along with that, they don't do any reviews, I mean performance reviews, because if they do performance reviews, it means people are going to ask for more money. And that means that as someone does a bad performance review, they have to fire people. And they don't want to fire people because they didn't have to pay unemployment. So people, good people quit or the shitty ones stay. <laughs> that's really what you're looking at. Damn. And that's that, but that's not with not all companies are like that. And also, you got to keep in mind here, it's a cost of living, so they make up for it, right? So everything costs a lot, but salary is a lot more also than others. So if you go to, let's say, I don't know, um, okay, so let's say Virginia. So if your um, someone's salary here is a hundred, a hundred thousand dollars. Virginia would probably be, let's say, 30,000 30, less, you know, so it's they they try to make up for it, you know, and that's where we have that that cost of living. And a lot of the high tech companies here, they do have um, yearly reviews and, you know, I don't know how many how much percentage they give um, you know, as as a raise. Well, one thing I learned here, there's like no doesn't seem like there's any middle ground, like middle class. No, you're either high or you're low. Yeah, either <laughs> either mm-hmm. high or you low. You're either working for the tech company or you you like really struggling. Mm-hmm. So that, that yeah. um but you know what? That seems to be like the way the world is going, period. Just like the haves and the have nots. So. Yeah, and it's not just it's not just here, which reminds me of, you know, back home, um, uh, I was born in the Philippines and I grew up there and in the Philippines, in our country, you know, in that country, it's either you're poor or you're rich. There's no middle class. And when I mean poor, they're really poor. Yeah. You know, um, and, and when you're rich, you're really rich. Like you can afford to buy rice 
when you're poor, you could barely afford to vote or you can't afford to buy rice. And I think, you know, it's not just here. It's it's everywhere. It's all over. Um, we just don't hear about it or we just don't see it. I think it's just more here. It's more uh, more amplified just because there's because the people here, they make so much money. I think mm-hmm. that's the biggest, the biggest difference. Like people like the people make as people who make a lot of money here, like like I see, I've seen so many Teslas on the road that you would think <laughs> that car's cheap, but Teslas are what, like eighty thousand? Yeah, it's eighty to a hundred. And you know, and Tesla around here it had became the norm, the kind of car that you just see normal. It's normal yeah, for like, you. Honestly. Yeah, <laughs> it's normal for you to see a Tesla. And you know, the school I work for, um, in the parking lot, sometimes you'll see five, six different Teslas. Yeah. Picking up their kids. I'm like, what? And I do get curious. Like, what the heck are they? Do? What What do they do for a living? What does his or, or her parents do for a living? But, sure, you know, it's sorry. exactly. It's normal for us to see that. And again, we are where we are here in San Jose. It's a Silicon Valley. So we are in the heart of Silicon Valley where all the high tech companies are. And, you know, hearing from other people also who lives in a different state, let's say in Hawaii, I've got some families there. They want to move here because to them, it's like. I want to move to the Bay Area because that's where the money is. That's where I can make money. You know, and then it's that's how. what they're doing too. Now, but I, but you know what? I'll say this because I do, um, I think I mentioned it. I do like Amazon Flex. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't, but I'm mentioning it now. <laughs> I do Amazon <laughs> Flex. And they, the people who, um, who I deliver to, they tip very well. Mm. So, there is something to the uh, the salary, like people have more money, so they give out more money. But yeah. saying that the, the homeless thing is a real, that's a real humbling thing. Like, um, like I, when I go out to eat or something, like if I go to the store, like I've I've, I've never bought so much food for other people since I've been here. Because there's people that you could tell they genuinely need food. Like it's oh, yeah. not one of those, yeah. You know, Oh, I'm just trying to get over. Like you can see them, their hands not clean, their body not clean. Like it, it's it's really uh, it, it. This place definitely humbles you, if nothing else, too. It definitely does that. You can totally tell, yeah. And since we're talking about the changes and you know the the differences that you've been experiencing in the past um, almost a year that you've been here, um, so I wanted to ask you this question. So so far for almost a year. I guess we've already heard some parts of it. How is it like for you moving here? What was it feel like from the beginning to now? Well, in the beginning, it was it was cool because it was like it was new, it was exciting, it was something different. So that was like from November to like uh, late January. And I would say like around February, that's when things started to change because it was like, okay, I'm here, but like, what am I doing? And I couldn't, I didn't really have, I didn't understand what my purpose was. So every day I'm waking up upset, I'm depressed, I'm frustrated. And I don't even understand what's going on. Like, I don't even notice these things. My wife was the one pointing it out. Like, you know, you, you, you you really depressed. Like you got a lot going on and I just didn't understand it. Like, um, I had been working for the government for 14 years. So, you know, no matter how you feel about something, if you've been doing it for 14 years, it becomes a part of you. And that's just something I didn't understand. So um, it's, it was a, it was in a tough adjustment, but um, it's, it's gotten a lot better. Just um, again, just doing Amazon and just letting time pass. And I've, I've been able to record a lot more podcasts because I have more time. So I'm able to pick my daughter up. So there's things that, I'm not gaining financially, but in my quality of life, just spending more time with family, spending more time with my daughter, being able to pick my daughter up from school every day, take her to school every day. Like that's been, that's brought a lot of joy to me. That's good. And, and with, I guess you were used to a daily routine and yeah. And moving here was, it just suddenly stopped for you. And that adjustment for a minute for you was it caused you depression. Now, 
because you said you didn't feel it your wife seen it and have you ever um experienced depression before i i have but i didn't it's ironic because every time i've experienced depression i didn't even know it like somebody else had to point it out I heard you say this before. Is it because you didn't know what depression looks like? Or when you think about depression, you think about someone who has a psycho- psych- psychotic breakdown or something like that. So do you not know the difference? Or I'm, I'm asking because you said the second time someone pointed out to you. Or can I tell us? Yeah, about yeah, that? it's cool. I, I think because I was able to, because I was able to keep moving. And I kept being able to tell myself everything's okay. Tell every people, tell other people it's okay. So when you when you um when your day to day doesn't change, in my opinion, it's hard to notice because my day to day never changed. Not in those not in the first circumstance. Like the first first time my day to day didn't change. Well, I me and my wife was going through a separation, so that was what caused it. But I was just telling myself that everything's okay, you know? Mm-hmm. So that's why I couldn't recognize it. So you were distracted and you were distracting your mind um, by, you know, with, with your day-to-day, your daily, um, just just working, your daily routine. Um, so with this recent one with the move here and as, that she noticed that, and I guess you realized it later on too, that maybe she was right. How did you overcome that? Mm. Uh <laughs> Honestly, I just, I I had to accept where I was and um, I just had to start telling myself, you know, you know, day by day, just, you know, take, because sometimes you can look ahead too far and that'll, that'll add on to your burden. So there was times where I just had to just look literally one day at a time, um, one moment at a time, just take it each day. Um, I started to go for walks. I started to exercise a little bit more, read a little more, just do more things for myself. Because one thing I had to understand, too, if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be any good to anybody anyway. So I had to I had to like take a step back and um, start doing things for myself. And recently, uh, probably within the last two months, I started talking with a therapist. So that helped a lot too, but that, it took a while for that to kick in. To be honest, because you have to, you know, I think I think Ron can can attest to this. Like, you just as a man, you you just don't want to feel vulnerable. So it took us a while to build that rapport for me to start talking to him and, and being more open about what my issues were and the things that concern me. You know what? I can attest to that in numerous different ways. Um... You know, my parents are old school. Old school meaning a group in the fifties. So back then, you just dealt with your problems. If you if there's crap going on, separation like you were going through, or you have with your job or sex life, it can be whatever, right? At some point, but you have a breakdown, and it was more or less, son, you're a man. I'm teach you to be a man, and your mom's job is to teach you how to deal with emotions. Okay, but because your mom left, my, my parents separated when I was like five. Um, she's not here, so I'm teach you how to be a man. And he avoided those subjects. It'd be when it came to doing puberty or anything like that. My dad avoided when talk talk about you know erections and what men go through. My dad uh, skated around when it came to talking emotions. Skated around it because he didn't want to talk about that at all. It was for him almost was it's taboo. And um, I think a lot of times, you know. As, as a man or as a human being, more or less human being in, in my context, we want to contribute to overall household. So how you had to move from, you know, Maryland out here, and now you depend upon your wife, you worked for the government, you had a coach job, you did your nine to five, you did your hours, and that was it. Now you depend upon y- your wife to take care of everything. It's like, damn, I want to, part, I want to contribute too. Um and and for me, it's like more or less like, wait a minute here. I don't want nobody controlling me. So the difference is, is I want to have the ability to, if the shit don't work out or stuff goes awry, I can get the hell out of here versus depending upon somebody else, right? I don't like that. I'm married when I was with my kid's mother. When I, I left California to move to Las Vegas for six months, she got pregnant. We came back. 
my dad was old school. You don't come back in once you leave. So I, I, her parents took me in. And when you put a job to come to come to California, I came back to California after quitting my job in Las Vegas. I had started over again. And, uh, you know, at the time, I had to borrow some money from my dad to pay him back. So I told her dad, hey, look, you know, this is my, my baby's mom's dad. I was like, hey, look, you know, I can't pay you rent. And remember, these people are on Section 8. So no, they're not paying for rent, okay? They just want extra income. Okay, so let's put that in there. Um, I said, hey, look, give me a couple of weeks, you know, because at the time, Fry's paid us weekly. So I said, hey, like, I pay next Friday. And you're just thinking, okay, someone sees you trying, right? So when you see a person trying, you're more likely to to give them a lead way, right? Okay, cool. Next week, that's fine, you know. And your daughter's pregnant, so no. So I came home from working from like at the time we were grand opening San Marco store. So I came came back to their apartment. Um, we worked from seven a.m. to like midnight. Come home, my shit is in a basket, like a shopping cart at a grocery store on the side. Get out of, get out of. Dad's like, get out of here, screaming hard and get out of, get out of because friends like you can't pay, you can't pay rent here. You don't stay here. I, I will never forget that. So for me, that's when I said to myself, I will never allow somebody to control my own destiny. Mm. So well, let me ask you this, because you said control your own destiny. It sounds like it was more financial, though. Oh, yes. Um, I felt I was not control of I felt power was taken away from me, meaning that I felt. That way, me, you see, I told you, I came to you, I said, look, you know, I'm going to pay you. Just, I thought you would give me some lead way, you know, just work with me, right? That's all I was asking for. And uh, it became demoralizing. Uh, I mean, you're almost on the street. That night, luckily, two blocks down, her grandmother lived there. He, and she took us in. Other than that, we had no place to go. I had no money. I had no place to go. And it's like, Wow, how can you do this to me? How can you do this to us? Is your daughter's pregnant? You see, I'm trying. I'm, I, wow, okay, cool. And of course, it's financial and emotional too, right? Because you hit something that I thought you cared about me. I thought you, you cared about your daughter. I thought you cared about us. You always talk about us and the kids and being a family, but now you turn your back on me at my, my weakest hour, you know? Yeah. And, and that those are my kind of issues I have to deal with money and lack. But yeah, I mean, being a man and, and not contributing, hell yeah, of course. And, and the, the biggest, uh, uh, you know, I want to ask you this question too, you know, um, I'm, I'm kind of curious. So most time being a black man or a black male, you don't talk about emotions or feelings. So yeah. talking to a therapist is like, dude, you must have some serious stuff going on. How was that for you? Talking to a therapist? Yeah, being a, you're a black man, you deal with your emotions, you're a go getter. How do I mean? It, how do you, you know what? It's not that hard, and I'm gonna tell you why. I think, I think when you talked about your father and and my father and and the pre the men before us, they didn't they didn't know how to handle their emotions, and but we have to take a step back and realize they didn't have anybody to show them mm -hmm. how to do these things, like. The, the gen, our generation now, um, we got more resources. We got more people, you know, people more available to us. Like, for instance, I don't like people, people, um, you know, people used to always say, well, black people don't kill themselves. You know, that was like one of the sayings. And it's just not true. Like black people do kill themselves. They get depressed like any other race. But I think now because because everything is so, you know, it's not taboo to hear about somebody killing themselves. It's it's still difficult, but people can um, people can see it more. It's it's more it's happening more often. I'm not saying that's good, but unfortunately, like the thing is, because something is happening so often, it's forcing you to talk about it. Even like me for like for instance, when when we work when I worked in the government, we used to always have to take training to deal with suicide prevention. And the first couple of years we did it, I used to get annoyed. I used to get frustrated because I'm like, why am I here? Why am I, you know, why am I doing this? I'm not going to be in this situation. But as it turns out, I never, I don't think I was in the situation, but I don't know because they gave, they did a good job of telling you things to look out for. And you just never know what a person is going through. And Things like I said, things now are just so different. Like people are way more open about their issues and their struggles now. It's not, 
you know, it's not like ye like years ago when a man was open about how he's feeling and what he's going through, it could be viewed as weak. But in this day and age, you actually get commended for, I mean, depending on the, the people who hear your story. They, of course, there's still some old school man like, ah, oh, just, just suck it up, just keep going. But for the most part, when a, when a man reaches out and says, hey, you know, I need help, I'm going through something, he's not looked at like he would have been looked at 20, 30 years ago. It's like, okay, this man needs some help. Let's get him some help. Yeah, think, and, and that's um, why. No, you go ahead, Gloria. No, I was just gonna say. I think um, also back then was it was more about you know like when you said being a man, you got to man up. You you can't show any type of weakness, and that's why to these days that that term is still being used, man up, because that's how it was learned. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? Now looking back, what James just said, I realized this. Um, you know what? We look at generations. We have the term I just used right now. I should have then used that. But old school way of looking at things. Yeah, it is. We consider old school, but that's all the information they had at that time. So they did the best thing they could. Yeah. They didn't have access to the internet or access to books. And some people couldn't even read or write. Or, you know, my dad grew up in a poor neighborhood in Chicago. So you may not have a library, right? Or or if you go to the library, what do you even ask for, right? Because exposure is limited now. With social media, the internet, we're now exposed to a lot of different things. Like, wait a minute, there is. Wait a minute, what? Oh, I can't get some help. I, I can't find somebody. It's it's okay. I can feel this way. I, I don't know what to do with it. And that's, so, you know, this thing about what James said, I said, man, you know what? My dad did the best thing he could because, first of all, his dad didn't do it. So it's like this. His dad was open and honest about his feelings and, and and all that stuff. How can I expect him to be open and honest with me? He, he, he didn't know any better. Right. We, it's so many, like, even you look at everything, like, just that, um, the bad relationships people get into. Like, if you trace it back and you look back, you'll see, you know, the people that they grew up with probably wasn't in a good relationship. You know, so you don't even know what a good relationship looks like. Mm -hmm. I, I, amen. I can say it's that. It's true. <laughs> you know, um, you guys talk about that, about your dad. It's funny. I, I didn't have my dad growing up. So, um, actually since from the day I was born, um, I don't know where he is right now, but I was raised by my mom and my grandfather. So my mom is actually what it's, what is like to you guys, like your dad, she raised me not to cry. <laughs> so kind of like you need to man up kind of way. Right. So she, she teaches me that way where you get hurt, you get up, and you don't cry. You fall, you get scratched, you don't cry. Hmm. And you know what's funny about what you just, not funny, but you know what's so ironic about what you just said? Hmm. Had, your, had your father been around, he would have never took that approach. Because, <laughs> because <laughs> I have, it's different for the girls. Yeah, I have a daughter, and there's no way I would tell her, you know, just get up and, and, and shake it off. You know, you kind of you kind of want them to, but at the same time, when it's a girl and it's a father involved, it's like, nah. You'd be the and first I, one there to to help her up, right? right? And, yeah. and I'm sure, and I'm sure, because Ron, you got what? You got boys, girls, what you got? Boys. So, so I'm sure he, I don't have sons, but I'm sure like when Ron, in Ron instance, his son fall down and it's like, hey man, dust yourself off. Get up. Come on, let's go. Cause we we as men we don't get you know unfortunately I don't I don't know if unfortunate fortunate whatever it's, life is just a double standard and we gotta accept that men, men don't get the hey you know oh are you gonna be maybe from your mother your mother will do that but if your mom do it your father gonna come right along hey 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 stop doing that to that boy like he he tough he gotta you know he gonna fall he gonna you know you gotta let him be a man let him grow so. It's you know that's why both parents are so important because they they provide that balance mm -hmm. because like I like like when your your mom would have done that but I guarantee you if your dad was around he would have came in that room behind your mom and like hey Gloria are you okay you know what's going on you know I can help you with that you know just something that a, a father would do that's true and that's where my my grandfather 
um stepped up as as my oh, okay. okay yeah he, he okay. took that yeah, okay. yeah and I, I do <laughs> yeah that's true and i do remember every time i know and when i'm about to get in trouble i run to him and i hide behind his back because he protected me from from, from my mom um yeah. but you know and, and that was the thing is that that's the hard part um and that same goes with the women nowadays too is that with us growing up our parents or our moms didn't tell us all these things that we're going to be going through, all the changes that our bodies will be going through and all the feelings and emotions that we will be going through because they just, although they went through it, but they didn't have all the resources that we do now. Um, I, I'm sure that they didn't understand why they were going through, you know, like, let's talk about menopause, you know, when they go through that, I'm sure they didn't understand it. Like, why, why am I feeling this way? Why am I angry today? And then the next day I'm okay. Why, why is my body feeling like this? Why do I feel ugly today? They didn't understand all that. They didn't know that all they know is that their body was going through changes and that they're going through menopause. So I'm hearing a lot of this from women nowadays, but it, nowadays our generation, there's a lot more resources. There's a lot more um, things that we can read about, about these changes that our body goes through. You know, where our doctors are, it's, they're reliable, they're more reliable. It's easy access. You know, we email them now and then ask questions. They, we get our answers back or we just go in and see them. Back then they didn't have that. And so they couldn't provide those, um, they couldn't provide anything like that to us to, and tell us why, why we would be feeling that way. Because now, well, you know, I, go through a certain things I asked my mom she's like yeah you'll feel that way once you reach that age you know I think some of it too um is your parents no matter how old you are no matter what you do how grown you are everything you accomplish you're still gonna be their baby that's, <laughs> so that's like, true so it's like you can't like they 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 can they can understand what's going on but they may have a hard time articulating which if you know how you should feel because they love you so much and they feel like they trying to protect you from something, even though it's inevitable that, it, that it's going to happen, but they're trying to protect you. And it's like, that's cool. That's great. But at this time, like I need you to give me some guidance. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's tough though. Cause I, it's, there's things like I'm, I'm my daughter. She's, you know, She's young, you know, she's a young girl and eventually she's going to start to develop and things like that. And it's like, those are things that I'm going to struggle with as a father, because eventually she's going to grow into a young lady and a woman. And then there's going to be, you know, young boys after her. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to talk to her about that. And those are going to be tough conversations because I don't want to think about some little young pup chasing my daughter mm -hmm. around, but. Yeah. It's going to happen. <laughs> it, yeah, it will. And, you know, and and honestly, like I, I've seen since I work for the school and I do, I'm I have a close relationship with a lot of my students, most especially the girls, because it, as a PE teacher, you view a PE teacher as a, like a male. Right. So a lot of our other PE teachers are male except me. So a lot of the girls are more closer to me and they open up to me and I have seen changes um, the changes that girls go through that a lot of fathers do not understand. Yeah. My wife tells me that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> even <laughs> if you, even but, if you but say, it's, I it's do hard. understand, you still won't. Yeah, it's hard because it's like you love your child so much. And it's like you think you, you know, you feel like you got the answers. You think you got the answers. But the reality is. Yes, I'm a father. Yes, I love my daughter, but I'm not a woman. Mm -hmm. And there's just some things I cannot identify with. And I had to really take a step back. Like there's times when my wife has to just take the lead on things because she's the woman of the house and she can understand and identify what my daughter's going through. So me as a father and a man, as much as it may hurt me or, or you know, I got to step back and let my wife handle that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it, you know, and it's, it's going to, it's going to be a ride, but it's going to be a fun ride for you. I, I have, so I have two boys too. And, um, so going into the school and being with a lot of girls, I, I've, you know, in the very beginning, obviously, I, I mean, I was really overwhelmed. I felt like I have all these girls that I've never had and they're different ages. And I've seen a lot of them grown from, 
you know, from your daughter's age or younger to uh, teenagers now. And I've seen the changes and I, I could see how it, what, how it's like at home having a girl. And, but the way I see it, it's, it's, it's a joyful ride <laughs> because it's, it's a total, there's a total difference between the boys and the girls. And we all know that even now with, you know, as an adult, there's, you know, you guys are, we all go through something different. I go through something different than you guys do as an adult. Mm-hmm. I got a question for uh, for James. So when you say your wife handles certain things and how so because she's a woman and she can resonate with your daughter, when you see that happening, do you sit back and listen, see what you can learn, or are you just like hands off? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> it, depends. <laughs> it depends because there's some there's some stuff that's just woman topics and I could just sit there and listen. I could listen till I'm till till I'm blue in the face. But I'm not a woman and I just can't identify. Like there's things that physically, you know, that'll be going on and I, I can't identify with it. Or just emotionally, because there's times you know, my daughter's nine and she she does these little things. She has these little, um, I wouldn't say outbreaks, but she's a little more emotional. My daughter can be very emotional. So I need my wife to step in because I'm not an emotional person. Like I don't, <laughs> I can be emotional, but there's times, you know, I'm, I look at things like as they are and that's not always the right answer, especially when you're dealing with a nine-year-old girl. Like, the, dealing with it as is, how you see it may not be the best way to deal with it. So, Why do you say you're not an emotional person? Uh, I, can't, I can be emotional, but I don't deal with, like, I don't deal with things in an emotional state, if that makes sense. Like, I'm usually, I usually put those in check. But again, we're talking about with my daughter, she's nine. So she doesn't really understand how to do that. And sometimes I struggle with, you know, giving her that leeway that she needs to grow as a young girl. Mm -hmm. Cause she hasn't figured these things out. I mean, like all of us, you know, Mm -hmm. when when you're a child, you don't know how to manage your emotions. You just get it. You may get emotional about things that you know, it's really not a big deal, but she's nine. So I have to understand like, hey, you know, she's nine, James. You got to <laughs> lighten up a little bit. It's going to be fine. And my, But thank God my wife is here. So she's the one who, she's the one who will balance me out sometimes because sometimes I can be a little overboard. So she'll, uh, she'll be the one to reel me back in. <laughs> yeah, you need, you need that good balance. Some, someone has to be the bad person sometimes. Um, yeah, I'm the bad person too much. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now, um, since you've been here for almost about a year now, how are things like for you? It's like I said, it's getting better. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just had to adjust. Like it took me a while to adjust, but um, I'm in a much better place. Just talking with, you know, talking with my therapist, understanding the things that I need to do, taking it one day at a time. Um, just finding things that bring me joy. Like, I, I, just, I think that's the biggest thing, too. Like, you know, you have to find things that bring you joy and, f- you know, help you feel like you're fulfilling your purpose. So that was something I had to take a step back and do. And I've been doing that. And mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, it's much better for me. Even And then, it's, you know, I take time. I do. Uh, I haven't worked out in a while, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just, just getting myself together physically because, that's something I had to understand too. Like the mind and the body do work together. So when you, you know, you feel better about yourself, you're confident, you know, you get a good workout, you just feel better. So there's just things that I'm doing to make myself feel better. And you know, joy comes from within happiness comes from within. Yeah. And I know that on our previous conversation, you've uh, mentioned about finding your purpose. Yeah. What is that like for you right now? Um, I, I'm actually feeling pretty good. It's um, I feel like I understand what my role is in life. Like I'm, I'm supposed to elevate people, and when I say that, like just help people. When you know, it may be, it may not be the highest level, but you know, when we meet, when we get a chance to interact, whenever we do anything together, 
you're better off when you met me than, you know, before we did, you know, before we did meet. Like I've added some value to your life. It may be a small piece, it may be a big piece, but the the important thing is I added something to you. And what do you want to add to people's lives? Um, joy, uh success, and, and just helping just helping un- helping people get their voice out. Like that's that's what my that's not a plug for my podcast, but <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I get the most out of my podcast. Just um, allowing people to tell their journey because, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we wait for people to uh, to be like highly successful. Everybody knows who they are, but they don't wake up successful. Like they don't they don't start off a success. Like there's a journey to get there. There's a process. And. I've been really fortunate. I've been talking to people that's like some are in the middle of that process, some some are at the beginning. Just depends. And then I, one thing I had to realize too, people have different definitions of success. My definition of success may not be the same as Ron's or Gloria's or anybody else's. So that's been one of the things I've had to learn. Like Because a lot of people would look at success as money. And that's not the case. But it took me years to understand that. Like you could be a you could be worth eight figures, but you know, you're a success to yourself, but you're not helping anybody else, you're not elevating anybody. And then once you leave here, nobody's gonna remember you. You just, you know, you just go away. <laughs> what was your definition like what I want to understand is what was your definition of success? And when did you have this kind of change where it says, okay, well, I don't want that or that doesn't serve me, but this serves me now? In the past, my definite success was always money. Like, oh, you know, you make this amount, this much money, you must be a success. And that's not to say you're not. It's just there's more to being a successful person than just money. Because, I mean, hell, you could hit the lottery overnight you play enough numbers and hit the lottery does that mean you're successful it just means you got a lot of money and 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 one thing too like just just like when you wake up and you feel good about what you've done like there was a lot of mornings i woke up and i wasn't feeling good about what i was doing wasn't anybody's fault it's just where i was in life you know going to work every day doing the same thing and it's just like man like what am i doing but it provided a check, and, you know. It was the mean. It was means for me to take care of my family, to you know, take care of my personal business, my bills, and things like that. So, I became accepting of it. But once I was able to get out of that situation and like move and relocate, it just gave me a new outlook on life, and that was something I really needed, good or bad. Because there's been bad struggle. You know, there's been bad times. There's been struggle moving to California, but. It's helped me. It's, it's made me understand who I am as a man, who I am as a person, the things that I need to do to better myself. So, is that that struggle has really helped me? Do you would you say you're now living intentionally? Uh, wow. I'm going to say no. I have to be honest and say no. And the reason I'm going to say no is because I'm starting to understand more how important planning is. Like, even right now, I'm just doing things. I'm just moving and moving and moving, but I'm not sitting down and coming up with a strategy for the moves I'm making. Mm -hmm. So that's why my answer is no. Mm -hmm. What was that breaking point in your life where you realize money's not everything? Like, what, what was that day and time? What it looked like for you? I've had, believe it or not, I've had a couple of them. Um, in my early 20s, I mean, I always think about this conversation. Now, I was a teenager when I had this conversation. I was talking with my cousins. We like brothers. And one day we were all sitting at the kitchen table and I kept telling them, listen, if you if you worth... $10 million, you happy. Like that's all life is. And, and crazy as it sounds, they were wise at a young age. I was about 16. One of my cousins was about 18 at the time. And the other one was 16, just like me. But they both was like, man, do you like, do you know how crazy you sound? Like 
No, like money is not everything. Like you have to be happy. You got to, you know, you got to be living life. You must be happy and money don't make you happy. But now again, I could say at 16, everybody thinks like that. But even as I got older, I started to think like that. But then I would say around about 22, 23, I realized that, you know, money is not everything. It's just about being happy. And then as things start happening in your life, you know, you start experiencing like um, tribulations and death and all types of things. It just makes you realize like uh, just how, you know, how trivial money can be. It's important. Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) don't get me wrong. I I would like to have eight figures, but (laughs) at the same time, there's things, you know, that you also need to complement that money. Like you need to be in good health. You need to be in a good mind state, you know, have good people around you. Cause you, again, you could be worth eight figures, but nobody loves you. Nobody wants you around. You're not happy about how you got the money. You're not happy about what you're doing in life. So it's a lot comes with that. So it's an overall picture, you know, it's an overall package that we all striving to get. Mm -hmm. The way I see this is that, you know, you have all these wants. You have, there's so many things that you want in life. And I think that now, you know, you've come to realize, and I think a lot of us after a certain time in our life that we got to figure out the whys behind those wants. And I think once you figure that out and you just have to keep digging and digging and digging to that why until you get to the bottom of it. Then that's when you said, you know, you've got a lot of these people, let's say, who has all this money because they've been wanting to have a lot of money. They want to live in a bigger home. And when they get that, ask them the question, are they happy? A lot of the people I know that has that, well, not a lot, but some, there's still a missing piece. But because they never really dug into the why behind the want. Yeah. I mean, what, and if if your if your whole goal is chasing money and you accomplish that, now what? What are exactly. you chasing? Exactly. Now that you have it, now what? What next? I mean, look at all the millionaires who've killed themselves. <laughs> I know. I I, I, I kind of giggled. I know yeah. it's not funny, but yeah. Yeah, it's 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 just like that. Like so, it's it's proven that money is not everything. It's like there's people who who are worth. They they had money that could take care of five six generations, and they still kill themselves. So it lets you know money is is not the answer. And the answer really is it comes down to their internal happiness. Mm-hmm. See, see, at one point those people or everybody, you know, including me, money at one point was everything. I mean, I used to daydream about winning the lotto and winning ninety million dollars. Until one day I woke up and said, wait a minute, I'm daydreaming about this thing all the time. I mean, I'm going to work, I'm daydreaming, man, for $90 million, I can buy a car, house, I could travel, blah, 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 all this stuff, right? Two things happened. I realized that, wait a minute, this daydreaming doesn't serve me. Second thing I realized is that it was creating more suffering because then that want becomes insatiable. Mm-hmm. Third thing I realized is that all it was, was going to do was the reason why I wasn't getting nine ninety million dollars wasn't the fact I wasn't playing the lotto. That's one factor, but the factor is, is how I was showing up intentionally. I was showing intentionally only to 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 inflate my ego. Which is, if I got ninety million dollars, I can buy that car, I can buy that house, I can go on a vacation, I can get the girl. Yeah. And in that equation, it didn't say anything about helping people or doing a podcast or starting a charity or doing anything to give back to the community. Then I stopped daydreaming about it. And, and then I realized money, really, in reality right now, I can travel. In reality right now, you know what? If I get whatever I want, you know? And why do I have to have $90 million to really have all that? I mean, if I had, if I had 30 cars in a driveway, how many cars can I drive one time? If you mess around and got, you know, a seven-bedroom, five-bath mansion, and that's 10,000 square feet, who's going to clean that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you got to think about all this stuff and it's like, dang, I, I don't need to have all the money to really be happy. Doing these podcasts with you and other guests, um, doing my life coaching um, aspect of the business, helping people out mentally, 
is really providing more joy. It's, it's making me be a millionaire because I'm giving exactly what I want to do instead of just getting the money to inflate my ego. That's all I was going to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing too, one of the hardest things to do is uh, just like when you was talking about the $90 million and one of the sad realities is when you really start to answer that question, what you want with $90 million, you really, then you start to learn more about yourself. Like, damn, I'm, I'm maybe I'm a more selfish person than I thought because it's like $90 million and you haven't thought about anything good to do with it. So you get that $90 million and you do all that stuff. You, you, you got all the fine women, you got all the cars, the big house. Then you realize, okay, what's next? <laughs> yeah. What's next? <laughs> Yeah. So that's that's ultimately what ends up ruining your life because you 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 don't have anything that, that that wakes you up because you already got it and you 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 lived that life it was fun and it's like okay now what like I don't know I, are y'all from me well I know y'all know who Mike Tyson is but do have y'all been like really following him lately No I, no. I haven't but I did uh, really dive into his biography about who he was and made him where he is today. But since then, I haven't followed him. He had, you know, Mike Tyson, of course, you know, youngest heavyweight champ, all that stuff. And he had all that money and he went broke and he never really took the time to identify who he was. And if you listen to him now, like he's really, really good to listen to because you wouldn't think he's a really intelligent person. You know, you just wouldn't get that because all you keep saying is Mike Tyson being a savage and talking crazy and, and being violent. But, you know, he's changed his life. You know, he's uh, he, he smokes a lot, <laughs> but that helped him. But, you know, but marijuana helped him. Like all the, you know, all the things that he's doing, they've provided him with peace. And that's and he he that's like the thing he's quick to mention. Like he's found himself and he's found peace. And he doesn't have the money he used to have, but he's in a much much better place because he knows who he is now. Mm -hmm. And, and that's some money can't buy. Exactly, and that's um you know I wish that here living in the in the, in, the, in the Silicon Valley, I wish a lot of people would come to realize that, you know, I mean, I was one of those people, you know, living here, working corporate, I, I went, you know, I've changed careers because I thought I keep wanting something different, but it always in the same, um, industry until I found, you know, working with the kids and coaching volleyball and then working at the school. And then I've just, that's when I've really discovered my real purpose and what I really wanted to do to say that I'm living intentionally now with, um, with my life coaching. So it was, it was a big change. And at one point, you know, like here, sometimes it's all about making the money. I was in the recruiting business and it was, you know, money was great. And, you know, working with a lot of startup companies, um, but like what you said, was I happy? I was happy, but there's always something in me that is still looking for something. And I couldn't figure what that was until now or until within the last year or so when I discovered, you know, life coaching and I went to training and it really, really opened me up and discovered who I really am and what I really want to do, regardless of if I earn money or not, but it's, it's where I found happiness within me. I think environments plays a big part too, because you mentioned Silicon Valley and the reality is <laughs> whether you want to ignore the elephant in the room, you do need money. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it's like, because it's because of you can live in a place that's so expensive, mm -hmm. you know, you why you don't want to pursue like you don't want your life to be totally chasing money but when you're in an environment where money is so important and it's you know it's so necessary you almost life almost forces you in that direction until you really step back and and, and take a strong stance that you know what i'm just going to trust that following my purpose following my destiny 
is the right move. But that's a tough decision to make because you said you was making like six figures and, you know, that's, listen, I don't care what nobody say. People got to be real, realistic. Like, you, you, we all talk about happiness. We all talk about living our purpose. But, man, when, you, when you're when making a good salary, you're making a lot of money, it's hard to make that jump because you the first thing you're thinking about, okay, what does this do to my quality of life? Mm-hmm. And once you once you make a change to that, yeah, that can cause some stress. Your quality of life changing. You you may there's things that you were able to do on that salary that you know with your new salary or your new walking journey, whatever you're doing now, you may not be able to do that, and that may cause some stress. No, and it and it is an adjustment, but that that's why it, it's up to you. If you know if that's what you really want, are you willing to make that jump or not? And a lot of it too caused, you know, what the cause of it too is when you see other people, you sometimes feel like, I mean, I'm going to be honest, you know, sometimes there was a time where I felt like I have to be on the same page as a lot of people like, well, these people are, you know, living this kind of life. Why can't I do that? They're going on vacations. They're going to all these places. Why can't I do that? Why can't I buy this kind of shoes? You know? So it, it was that, but I've, you know, came down to a point where okay well if i do get that then what it takes a while to get to that point though it really <laughs> oh, does yeah. i'm not gonna say that it took me like you know it took me overnight but i mean since i started working after college and i'm in my 40s now so that took a long time super long but you know yeah. it's like, I think, like, honestly i think it take it literally takes life beating the hell out you to get to that point because it's like you know what at this point shit it can't get any worse <laughs> <laughs> you got a point there it's true <laughs> like sometimes life just give you that 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 hand is just so hard to get through you like man you know what the hell with it i might as well just play this hand the way i want to play it because trying to play it the right way hell i'm gonna be down in the dumps anyway so i might as well get some joy out of playing this hand Mm-hmm. But that's how things happen sometimes. Sometimes it takes it takes something drastic to happen. Like honestly, a lot of times it takes something drastic to happen. Even with me, I'll be the first to say I don't think I ever would have left the government. I don't because it provided me with comfort. It provided me with stability. But that's the thing about being comfortable and being stable. You you'll never reach your full potential being comfortable and stable. No, you won't. Uh, it, it, it's, it's ironic. So I've done that now twice in my life. Um, one was to quit my full-time job, and it was excruciatingly hard because, you know, you, you're getting paid every two weeks. You know, you pretty much, unless you do something stupid, you know, they're not going to fire you. You know, you just come to work, do your thing, and leave. You know, you get your pay PTO, we you got your health care, you got all that stuff coming in. And every now and then you get a little bonus coming in. But what started happening for me is probably I was going through a, a level of depression, but didn't recognize it, is going to work, I thought I was committing mental suicide. And not literal, but mental, meaning I give more of my context is I wasn't growing mentally. Like I wasn't learning anything new. I was being challenged. I wasn't being part of a team. I was just a number. And um, I had said, man, I, I got to do something, you know, and it, 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 life happened like this, you know, very, if, if this didn't happen, I wouldn't be here. Two things happened. First thing is I found out coworkers making 14% more to me base salary. I said, I got to get the hell out of here. And that person had <laughs> seven years less seniority. So imagine you're in the government, right, James? And you find out coworker just got hired. He has only seven years in, you got 14 years in, he's making... 40% more than me, you'd be pissed. Well, I'm, I'm, let me stop you for a minute. It depends. Let me, because I, because I, on, on one end, I see what you're saying, but it depends on the career field I'm in because that person could, let's be, you know, let's, let's be honest, you know, level education matters. So that person could come in with like a master's degree or something like that. So they, even though I've been on the job a little longer, education is king and, for some reason, whatever reason, people just feel like education equals credentials, which, I mean, 
It does. <laughs> like, it doesn't mean that that person can do the job better than you. You know, they would have more success doing the job. It's just they went to school, they got the education, and that 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 uh, certificate, that degree, man, is worth a lot. Yeah, you know what? Give me more context. Depending on job, yes. Uh, in my case, it was I couldn't believe it because. Um, you know, the company I worked for, it pretty much was like a scheme, a pyramid scheme. You know, <laughs> it, it just really, really was. And the honest truth is, is that every square footage in that store, they tried to sell it for the highest bidder. And uh, when Fry's was doing really well in retail, we were like the strong arm in retail. We'll, you have to bend on backwards to get business with us. And, and people would up until, you know, Best Buy took off, Costco, Amazon, you know, online business took off. And that, that was wake up and I said to myself, I, I got to get the hell out of here. So for nine months, I worked my ass off, you know, day and night to get out. And it wasn't until I came to Crossroads was I was like, I just can't do another consumer electronics show. I can't go to Vegas to do shows. I just hated it. I just hated it. I couldn't do it anymore. I mean, I ain't got to the point where I found a nurse friend of mine right me a doctor's notes. I could take some time off. Because during holiday period, which is like right now, back then, you can take any time off, right? So you yeah. would have to work. You're working bell to bell, open and close. You're working all kinds of hours, even on weekends. So I got a nurse friend give me a note so I can go wine tasting. That's exactly what I did. But it's neither <laughs> here or there. Um, and I came back, and I was just going back and forth. I was just like on that teeter-totter. And I met a guy, and he said, without taking risks, you never know success, and I quit. Yeah. And, um, you know, that was the first time in my life. And, you know, from then on, I, I started in personal training, fitness and world and, and doing personal training. I realized, man, this, this ain't ha- make me happy either. Because I thought glitz, gamis, you, glitz and glamour, which is you working, you're, you, you, you know, getting clients, you're making money. And it, don't grant it, it made me some really good money. But then I realized, man, I need something else. And that's why I started doing a life coaching thing. And now I pretty much not essentially quit, but no more in-person training with clients right now. I mean, everything's virtual and that base. And I'm starting over again, but with more experience, more intention on living in what I want for the rest of my life, you know, because I just turned 37. You know, I got at least a good 20, 30 years, good years left to, to really make an impact. And, you know, what happens from there, I don't know. But Wait a minute, how, many, how many years you say? 30 years left, 25, 30 years left. Okay. Okay. So I can make impact. That's like, cause that to me, that's like, I have enough experience and knowledge now to make something happen for other people. And, you know, now I'm starting off from ground zero podcasts, you know, shoot my videos and just getting it started. So, but it's more intentional now because now I'm enjoying it more or less when I was training, trying to get clients. It was like, I'm scared. If I don't get clients, I'll go broke. That was the mentality. And that, that cost me to work. You know, I, long as I have a work was 25 days straight with no day off. And that means I'm working from 6 a.m. in the morning to like 9 o'clock at night. And that means I'm seeing like maybe, you know, 10 to 15 clients a day. And uh, that's what I did. And, man, at the period of time, it wore me the hell out. I had to let it go. I just I had set, I set my own pace. Man. Wow. So, yeah, you know, what? Right, and really what it was is that living, living in Bay Area, you know, I wanted money. I wanted money. I was money hungry. And... <laughs> and it, it, it got me hungry. Saying, that's what I was saying. Like areas like this, man. It, you, as much as you want to take that leap, you like, man. If I take it, you know, what's next? Like because you got people depending on you. Like you got, you got, you know, you got a, a woman in your life. You got your kids. There's people who are depending on you. So it's like as you get older. That's the thing too, like age, because as you get the, the older, you, I feel like this. I, I don't, I, I don't know. I, there's no science on this, but in my opinion, the older you get, the harder it is to take risks because you're so stable and you're so comfortable. And it's like, man, I don't want to lose this. But the the special people, the great ones, man, they taking risks and they don't care. It's like. Man, if, if I'm gonna fall, I'm, if I'm gonna fall on my face, I'm gonna fall on my face, but I'm gonna jump. <laughs> and but that's that's how they that's how they got to got to be so great because they were fearless. But that's hard to be, especially when you got people depending on you. If it's just you, because if, if it's just you, like you may you may feel so strong about you, what you plan on your plan and what you should be doing, you may say, you know what, the hell with it. 
I'll, I'll room with a neighbor. I'll do this. I'll do that. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to see my, my dreams come true. But when you got a family, you can't think like that no more. It's like, okay, even though I feel this strong about it, even though I want to make this move, what is it going to do to my family? You know, how is this going to affect my family? And once you once you start thinking about that, it really decreases your odds of taking that leap. You you basically gave me something I will never forget. So I was in the gym um, and, you know, people observe you, right? So a period of time when I was doing, I was doing training thing. People see me come in there with my training clothes on, which is like, you know, pants and, and my RJ Health and Fitness shirt. And then people see me then change and go my white shirt and tie because that's what Fry's Man's wear was like pretty much a suit to work. And people saw me, you know, people go over to the gym, they go there for years, right? And they then they started seeing, wait a minute, this guy's not leaving to go somewhere else. He's here all day. And I was in the gym. I just got done working out. And I don't forget his name. He had to be in his 40s. And he says, man, so you quit your full-time job? I was like, yeah, I did. You know, and I was telling my story. And he's like, oh, that's cool. Just, man, you know what? I had to give you a lot of power, man. Because you know what? I had an opportunity to quit my full-time job. And uh, it happened a couple. It happened about four or five years ago, he says. And, and what happened was they threw some money at him. And he's like, dang. Oh my God, I got a kid. I'm married. I, I, I don't know if I can do this. And he, he didn't do it. He didn't quit. And now he has that chip on his shoulder of, man, dang, I, I, I should have took it. I should have took that money. I should have took the leap. And he says, man, don't ever do what I did. And when you have the opportunity, take that leap. But what I do my, myself now, to program myself, when it comes to take time, take leaps. I ask myself, Ron, if not now, when? Because if I can't give you a date and a time when, then there is no right time. Now is the time. And that's how I use program myself. That may work for me, but it may not work for somebody else. But I had to do those things because, you know what? If I don't do it now, if not now, when? And see, what, 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 what kind of got me ignited, this this fuel and burning desire was when I saw my dad dying five years ago and he had so much potential inside him and all these things he wanted to do for his life and watch him die with all that potential that I saw and he had. And 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 that's another story in, in entirety, but I saw it's like, man, I don't want that to be me. I, I got to do something different in my life. And that's what I said. And, and that's what I'm doing, something different in my life. So that's my quick story. Just like what James was saying is that sometimes, or most of the time, it takes something tragic to happen to go through, to make those changes in your life or adjustments. You wake up. Mm -hmm. So James, yes, I know we kind of went over time here. I do apologize, man, but it was oh, really, no, really good. I told you, man, when I do my podcast, I don't, I don't, put, I don't have people put me on the schedule because I don't put people on the schedule. So oh, yeah. Awesome. So... <laughs> After listening to your story and you know some insight, give me some better insights. So I thank you so much. If you want to set something that can remember you on Life Shuffle Podcast, what would you say to be remember? What's one thing you would help kind of resonate to the rest of the people that will listen to this? What would you say to those people? For me, for them to remember me, yes, mm -hmm. that's one thing you would say. When I when 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 my time is up on this earth, I want people when they think about me, I want them to think about all the people that I made their life better. That's all I want. Man, that's awesome. I like that. That's great. law of the farmer. You want to? That's how you can live your legacy. It's just I want people to remember me because you you said earlier about loving people up. You know, you don't care how successful they are, what they do, but if I can be a part of their journey, look like just like you're part of Glory and Eyes Eyes journey. Right now, you're leveling us up as we talk, yeah. and mm -hmm. I, and y'all doing the same for me. Because again, I don't that that's the beauty of these podcasts. You never know who's listening. Right, that's an awesome thing. You exactly. never know. You just, mm -hmm. you never know. Making a message out the blue from somebody you haven't heard from in like 20 years that says, "Hey, I listen to your podcast. Boy, you're doing big things." You just never know. Or or it could be as simple. It can be this: someone that's getting ready to commit suicide because they don't think they have any hope left. And listen to a podcast and don't commit suicide. It can can be either or. You just don't know. Yeah. And never know. So thanks again, James. I really appreciate it. This is Ron Johnson, your mentor coach and life coach. And thank you for listening to another episode of Life's A Shuffle. 
And this is Gloria Life Coach. And again, thank you for listening to another episode of Life's a Shuffle.